So we are in a sermon series that is titled, We Are All Theologians. We're now in part three. And so this morning, I want to take a look at a doctrine that I particularly love. I am continuing to grow in it, and I'm continuing to be blown away by what it is uh, that God is doing in and through us, through his son, Jesus. And so we're going to talk about the doctrine of propitiation. The doctrine of propitiation. Now, uh, a dictionary would define propitiation this way. It is to appease. It is to settle. It is to calm down. Uh, That's what the dictionary says. In fact, a a good friend of mine and pastor in the U.S., Pastor Joby Martin, he, he says this, to understand propitiation is to understand it this way. It is a price that satisfies It is a price that satisfies. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 says this. God presented him, this is speaking of Jesus, God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his restraint, because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. The, The English Standard version says it this way, and I'll read from verse 23 just for context. It says this, for all have sinned, that's, that's you and me, all of us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. We unpacked justification last week. If you didn't hear it, I encourage you to go listen to it. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Jesus' blood satisfies the wrath of God that was meant for us. That's what propitiation means. It means that Jesus' blood satisfies the wrath of God that was meant for us. For us, but but let me unpack this. You see, because God is holy and just, the sins of people must be punished. And yet, in His kindness and grace, He has chosen to love us. However, in His justice, He cannot sweep our sins, which are acts of cosmic treason against him. He cannot just simply sweep them under the carpet and just move on. So in his love, he made a way to satisfy justice and still provide mercy. See, God in the second person of the Trinity that is found in the person of Jesus Christ takes on human flesh and blood and offers himself in the place of sinful people to have the just wrath of God the Father poured out on him and pay for our penalty for sin so that in his death all who trust and believe might find eternal life. I'm, I'm literally just laying down the foundation for us to understand propitiation, a price that satisfies. You see, his blood, this is Jesus' blood, signifying the sacrificial giving of his life in the place of those deserving death propitiates, it it satisfies God's righteous wrath, upholding divine justice and then also opening the floodgates of his mercy towards all those who would believe. Now, I know that the idea of propitiation is an unpopular one, even among the people of God. It's an unpopular one. And there's a ton of reasons why people push back against it. But for the sake of time, let me give you two. The reason, number one, that people struggle with propitiation is because if we believe it, then we must acknowledge and deal that there is a holy God who is justified to pour out wrath on wicked and disobedient people. Like, like we just have to sit with it. If we're going to say, no, 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 I, 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 I believe in the blood of Jesus. I believe that it satisfies. Then, 
if that's the case, then you have to sit and deal with the fact that there is a holy God. There is a holy God who pours out wrath on wicked and disobedient people. That's objection number one. Objection number two is that as we're talking about the, the, the blood of Jesus and sacrifice, people tend to think of it as a cult-like idolatrous worship. And so therefore, it, it cannot be of Christian, a Christian nature, right? Like it's, it's like you're talking about sacrificing someone and blood being poured out and, and then that satisfies a, a God. And like that just sounds like cult-like idolatrous worship. And so, hey, man, I, I, no, I don't believe it. Well, let me provide some defenses to those objections. God is holy and glorious and is worthy of all worship, all surrender, and all love. We covered this in part one and part two of the sermon series. And so anyone who does not give him full worship, full surrender, and full love is deserving of the punishment due. Uh, Again, friends, uh, if you're only joining us now, I would encourage you to go listen to part one of our sermon series, where I unpack this beautiful truth that God is glorious. And if he is glorious, then he is worthy of it all. And so when we sin, when, when, when we turn our backs on him, we are deserving of every punishment. This is what some might call cause and effect. We sin, there is a consequence. Yeah. Cause and effect. And, and here's the weird thing. Here's the weird thing. In our everyday lives, we believe that. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Yeah. But when it comes to God, then we're like, no, 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 God, hold on. Not, not, not for you, but for me. I want my justice. If I've been harmed, I want justice. Where do you think we get that from? if not God himself. So we have to deal with the fact that God is glorious. With regards to the cult-like worship, well, in the Bible, unlike other cults or, or, or practices or traditions that we are familiar with, you see, in the Bible, God is always the one who provides the sacrifice. Friends, I want you to think about that for a moment. Yeah. How, how, how on it could, could what, what you're referring to as propitiation, how, how, how is this different from cult practices? Well, God is always the one who provides the sacrifice, the propitiation that we need. You and I don't come up with a strategy to try to manipulate and appease God with a sacrifice of our own choosing. In love, God provides to and for us precisely what his own justice demands. See, whether it's with Abraham in Genesis 15, where we we see the, the establishing of that covenant, Abraham goes to sleep and then God God provides. He provides. He walks through. Whether it's with Moses, with the Mosaic sacrificial system, the point is this. God, knowing that his people would sin and break his law, in love and grace provided blood sacrifice in order to turn away his just judgment, assuring that there is a continuation of fellowship with him. And that's not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. If we look at the book of Hebrews, it is clear that Jesus is the real sacrifice given to the world by the Father. That the Mosaic sacrificial system was only a trailer attraction for what was to come. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 10, verse 4 to 10. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, 
as he was coming into the world, he said, you did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You do not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, God. After he says these things above, he's, you do not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. Then he says, see, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. Jesus comes and he says, no, 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 I know you've been doing this, but, but I have come to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. The sacrificial system was a lay-by pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know some of us, uh, when I say that, you're like, I have, I have no idea what, what, is, what is a lay-by Right? What is, what is that? Because we now live on, on credit cards, which simply means that you're spending money that you don't have, which is another whole issue that we need to get into. But, but, there, but there are folks in the room who remember lay-by, yeah. where you would go to a store and you would pick an item. And you'd say to the owner, I, I, I want that dress. I want that shirt. I want those shoes. I just don't have the full payment for them. Yeah. And so would you hold them in my name for me? And so every month you would go and pay a little bit. Pay a little bit. Pay a little bit. See, every month you would go and, and you would see it. I mean, it's, it's yours, but it's not yours. Yeah. Right? It's in your name, but it's not quite fully yours. And you've got to keep paying. You've got to keep paying. But it's just, it's never enough until the full payment. Yeah, yeah. The mosaic sacrificial system was a lay by pardon. The blood of Jesus was the final satisfying payment. Amen. Amen. And, it's, and this is us. Every month, every month we're paying, we're paying. And you think like, surely, surely I should be getting to the full. But you're not. And so Jesus rolls up and he says, you know, step aside. Mm. Oh, I'll pay. Oh. I'll pay it all. God always provides for that which he demands. God always provides for that which he demands. Friends, we have a God-size problem. Therefore, we need a God-size solution. This is why propitiation matters. Because there's nothing, there's nothing that we can do that can satisfy the wrath of God. Now, there are tremendous benefits of the blood of Jesus. Tremendous benefits. In Christ's blood, we receive life that death cannot conquer. Jesus has established a new covenant through his blood and he intercedes on our behalf to enable us to enter more fully into this blood covenant. There are beautiful benefits because of the blood of Jesus. And it's all because of this new covenant. Jesus says in Luke 22 verse 20, this cup is the new covenant of my blood which is poured out for you. And there are tons, tons, tons of beautiful benefits of the blood of Jesus. The benefits of propitiation. But for the sake of time, permit me to give you seven. Seven benefits. Now, you might be sitting here going, why seven? Honor, is there any significance to the number seven? Yes. See, seven in the Bible is the number for completeness, for wholeness. Uh, this is why I want to give you seven. This is why I chose seven. But also, hear this. See, in the tabernacle that God instructed Moses and the nation of Israel to construct, we see this in Exodus, we'll see, if you go read it, you will see that the innermost part of the tabernacle was a place called the Holy of Holies. And there was something in there that was called the Ark of the Covenant. 
in that ark was the law of God, the, the two tablets, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the law of God in that ark. That ark had a covering. It had a lid. If we had the screen on, I would have shown you, but I'd encourage you to just go Google it for yourself later. That covering, that, that lid was called the mercy seat. Yeah. And in Leviticus chapter 16, particularly verse 14, but the whole chapter just really talks about the, 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 the role and the function of the, the high priest when they were to go into the Holy of Holies. But in verse 14, it tells us that the high priest would go into the Holies of Holies on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Amends, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Guess how many times? Seven times. Friends, it's all connected. It's all connected. We cannot, we cannot read this thing. Like, it, I know we've got chapters and verses, and, and those things are incredibly helpful, but that is not how it was written. This was meant to be one story. God telling us one story. And so I have seven. Seven benefits. You guys ready? Seven benefits that come from the blood of Jesus. Benefit number one is forgiveness. Amen. You and I have been forgiven through the blood that Jesus shed when he gave up his life. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Not, not your blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13 says this, but, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that only happens because of forgiveness, that you've been forgiven. What a benefit. What a benefit. And, and, and here's the thing, here's the thing. For, for, for many of us, for many of us, we have not even stepped into that, that initial benefit. We're still out here trying to do things on our own, believing that, no, my, my blood, sweat, and tears is what will forgive me. And, and many of us, we, we believe that because we think, well, Oni, I, I grew up in the church. Oni, I, I show up on a Sunday. Oni, I, I show up during the week. Friends, you can, you can do all of these things, which are great things, great things. But those things, those things cannot do what the blood of Jesus does. Yeah. Yeah. You were once far. And the only way that you could be near is by the blood of Jesus, which forgives. And so, Father, right now, I pray, I pray, I pray the blood of Jesus for those who are sitting here and, and, and you, you realize and you recognize that, that maybe that is what I've been holding on to. That is what I've been trusting, like trusting all these outward things, believing that that is what forgives me. Lord, I pray now that you would cover them in your blood and that they might experience forgiveness, real forgiveness, forgiveness that comes from the heavens and that reconciles us back to the Father. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Benefit number two, sanctification. I'm gonna throw in here cleansing as well and you'll see why in a moment. Sanctification. See, we can, we can take this further, like it's not just forgiveness, but, but also that we are being sanctified, that, we are, that we're being called holy, yeah. that we're being set apart. Yeah. Each believer in Jesus Christ is set apart for God's glory yeah. and for God's work. Amen. For God's glory and for God's work, you've been set apart. Mm-hmm. Only Jesus' blood can make this possible. Yeah. Yeah. Because of him, we can walk on the straight and narrow. Yeah. We can do that which he has called us to do only because of the blood. Yeah. But I threw in cleansing because our, 
our conscience has been washed by the blood of Christ because we have truly been purified, purified of all sin. Let me read a verse for you. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience? See, our conscience is where our morality lives. Not, not, not only does the blood set you apart, not only does it, does it propel you to do the work of God, but, but it continually cleanses you. It cleanses you from dead works so that we can serve the living God. There's many of us who go, no, I've crossed the line of faith, but I I don't find myself doing good works. I only think evil things. I am selfish. Well, you need the blood of Jesus to cleanse that part of you. And it does. It does. 1 John Chapter 1, verse 7 says this, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You want to walk in the light? You need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. See, the blood of Jesus allows us to do that. It allows us to to live in such a way that, that everything that we do becomes a sweet fragrance unto the Father. Oh, how so many of us need that. Benefit number three. Redemption. This, this, friends, this is one of my favorite. And we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Redemption. Not only in the blood are we forgiven and sanctified and cleansed, but we also find in the blood that we have been redeemed from the clutches of the powers of darkness. We don't use this word redemption a lot because we, it's, it's slave language. The fact that you've been purchased, you were once a slave and now you're redeemed. And so we don't use it because we don't think of ourselves as slaves. And yet scripture tells us that before you come to Jesus, you are a slave to the prince of darkness. And yet the blood redeems us. Oh, I love redemption. I love redemption because even in it, there are so many implications for our lives. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In Christ, by by the shedding of his blood, which forgives our sins before God, he purchases our freedom from the wrath of God and from the power of Satan. Friends, we're in chains, bruised, battered, broken. And we're standing there on the block, all of us, all of us, as Satan taunts us. And then Jesus comes and he says, I I want all of them. And then Satan goes, probably with a smirk on his face, it's going to cost you. And Jesus says, and I give it all. Every single drop to purchase us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. I'm going to give you a ton of passages today. And when you were dead, Not on life support. Not in ICU. Dead. In trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt. Satan was holding it. Certificate of death with your name on it. Jesus rolls up, picks it up, tears it apart. He raised the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us 
and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them. Friends, we, we have freedom because of our redemption. We have freedom because of our redemption. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For f- freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. We should be living as free people. If you've been covered by the blood and you've been redeemed, you should live as a free person. And yet we don't because we still have Satan's voice in our ear. You're not enough. Look what you did. How dare you do it again? And yet we've been given freedom. Freedom. But not just freedom. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 T11 says this, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Not only do we have freedom because of the blood of Christ, but we are given authority because of the blood of Christ. The the, the accuser, the accuser constantly in your ear. We can say, be gone. Be gone. Authority over the devil is what we have because of the blood of Christ. And yet we don't live that way. (sighs) Friends, there is someone who knows, maybe even better than you do, the power and the authority given to you by the blood of Jesus. He will do anything to make sure you never find out. He will try to keep you distracted, send people or ideas to confuse you, and plant seeds of doubt to keep you from operating in what you have in the blood of Jesus. He will try to convince you that your redemption is temporary. Satan has the same playbook. The same playbook. It is to create doubt. When he tempts Jesus, he says, if you, if you really are the son of God, creating doubt. If there's anyone who has anything to lose by you finding out the truth, the authority that you possess, if anyone has anything to lose, it's him. The blood is our defense, friends. It declares we are not guilty, no longer slaves to sin, death, and him. Instead, we are free. The blood kicks Satan out of the affairs of our lives and our families and our situations and our circumstances. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Friends, this is why I tell my kids that Satan is a loser. I give them those words because that's, that's what he is. He's a loser because of the blood of Jesus. He's a loser. But maybe that falls under the, the doctrine of lucification. Right? The, doctor, the doctrine of lucification. So the doctrine of Lucifer who is a loser. No, no, it doesn't. No, you guys aren't feeling it. That's totally fine. Totally fine. I'll keep it to myself and our kids. Every day, you and I have the right to exercise the authority that the blood of Jesus yeah. has given us. Yeah. Refuse to give the enemy even one small inch of territory in your life. Yeah. Satan is a defeated enemy. And through the precious blood of Jesus, we are victorious. And so right now, I I know, I know that there are folks in here who don't live that way. 
You're carrying burdens that you shouldn't be carrying. You're believing things that you shouldn't be believing. And you're not exercising the authority that the blood of Jesus has given you. And so I know every Sunday, every Sunday I'll go, hey guys, you know, after the gathering, please come to the front if you want to do that. And some people come and some people don't. And my fear, my fear every Sunday is that there are folks in here who are going, I, I, I need it. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. And that might be you again the Sunday. And so here's what I'm going to do. If... If you're going, I've been covered by the blood of Jesus. I've been redeemed. I have freedom. And yet, I just, I I feel, I feel like I'm not living out of that. I'm going to ask you to stand. And the reason I'm going to ask you to stand is because I want to pray over you. I want to pray the blood of Jesus over you. Because imagine, just imagine that you were liberated to do that which God has called you to do because you are covered in the blood, that you are redeemed, that you are free, and that Satan has no authority over you. I'm just going to ask you to stand. And, and notice I'm standing. Because I need to believe that. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you're carrying, whatever, whatever, whatever circumstance that you're looking at, and you're just going, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if God's called me to it. I don't know if I should do it. I don't know. That's the accuser. If God has said it, then go do it. Amen. I asked this question at the Awaken series. I said, if you could do something for the glory of God and you knew it wouldn't fail, what would you do? And then once you've told me, I'd go, then why aren't you doing it? Because the accuser is in my ear. I'm not good enough. I'll never make it. And so, Father God, I pray right now. I pray that your blood would cover every single person that stood up right now. That you would remind them that they are redeemed, that they have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Father God, I pray that you would give them all that they need to to live in light of this freedom. I pray against Satan's distractions. I pray against Satan's words of doubt. I pray now that God, the visions and the dreams that you have given your people, that they will begin to walk in them not for their glory, but for your glory, not for the advancing of their kingdom, but the advancing of your kingdom. There are so many people who have yet to hear the name of Jesus. And so God, I pray that right now you'd be releasing your children. Give them everything that they need. Open every door of blessing. Not for their name's sake, but for yours, not to build their own platform, but to put on display who you are. We need you, Jesus. And we thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Friends, you may be seated. We're going to move quickly now. Benefit number four. This is going to sound super weird, but stay with me. Historically, we used to just cut the wires. Is that, is that, if, if, the, if the code doesn't work, then cut the wires. And, and Jesus will put them back together again. Amen? Amen. Oh, it's one of those Sundays, friends. It is, it is one of those Sundays. He has no authority over us. Benefit number four, justification. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go too much into this. We unpacked it last week, but I'll read a passage. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 11. Hear these words. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more than since we have now been justified by his blood will we be saved through him from wrath 
For if we, while we're enemies, we're now reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've been justified by the blood of Jesus. Benefit number five. The blood of Jesus gives us healing. The blood of Jesus gives us healing. Jesus says in Luke chapter five, verse 31 and 32, He says, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All of us need a doctor. Because none of us are righteous. And so the blood of Jesus heals us. The blood of Jesus justifies us so that we might receive the righteousness of God. So so there is healing power for salvation in the blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 to 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For those who have crossed the line of faith, you've been spiritually healed. If you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have been spiritually healed. And I get it, I get it. It's like, yeah, but I'm still carrying brokenness and and diseases and ailments, and and I'm still carrying those. But, 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 But hear me, hear me. He comes first to heal you spiritually. Because that is actually what you need. That is your greatest need. And that one day, my body, my body and your body will be completely healed. Amen. Completely healed. Amen. We can anchor ourselves in that truth because of what the blood of Jesus does. But what about healing today, Oni? I'm glad you asked. Yes, the blood still works for that. Now now remember, of first importance is your spiritual healing. But the blood of Jesus still works for my physical healing today. Which begs the question, should we pray for healing? Yes. Uh The New Testament instructs us to ask God to distribute his gifts for the glory of Jesus. And and one of those gifts is to, to pray for healing to pray for the sick. I think sometimes we we don't pray because we're afraid of disappointment. And so it's easy to have zero expectations. Let's walk in with zero expectations because it's like, well, then I won't be disappointed. But that is a lack of faith. It is a lack of faith. Don't settle for little faith and low expectations. God, would you stir in us? Stir in us. We should earnestly desire this gift. And and, and it may not be for me, but I I earnestly desire this gift for us as a community. Amen. Amen. Earnestly desire healing for the common good of our church. But also, it's not just for the good of our church, but also when this gift is on display, it becomes a witness to the world that God is real. That God not only heals us spiritually, but he heals us physically as well. And so then how should we pray on it? If if I'm tracking with you, how then should we pray? Well, the, the Bible provides a few models Not formulas, not formulas, but models. James chapter five, verse 15. 
says this, if, is any among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. I, I wish I had time to unpack this. Be, because I wonder, I wonder if we do any of these two. Like if, I think we don't sometimes. It's easier to suffer alone and to not be truthful and so then no one prays for you. And then like, we're like, no, I'm cheerful. And it's like, yeah, but your face, I think it's not connecting. <laughs> Definitely a glitch in the system. Then he says in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And there's, now there's a, there's, a, there's a ton here. I, mean, I could unpack four, four reasons on like why oil and why should, like, because it's been massively abused. And I get that. I get that. But just because things are abused, we don't swing all the way to the other side and go, yeah, then, then we don't do it at all. You know, I've seen the abuse, and so therefore, even though God's word says it, you're like, you know what, I think it's safer for us just to not do it at all. H how is that any better? H how? I know some of you are going, but Oni, you're an elder. Yes. Yes. And, and even in that communicates so much because elders have been given authority over a local church. Yeah. I am not an elder of the church down the road. Yeah. An elder here with covenant members. And so where does the praying happen? Here, like if someone shows up and goes, hey, you know, I'm really sick, Could you, I need the anointing from the elder, from men of God, please, I need the anointing. I'll be like, oh, where, where are you a faithful covenant member? I would happily pick up the phone and call the elder and tell them, hey, one of your congregants needs you. And so already that's, it speaks to, to the fact that the, that the local church matters. Yeah, amen. The local church matters. Yes. Yeah. But this praying, I don't believe it's just for the elders. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 and 9 says, a manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. So one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. Oh, where are our wise people? Where are they? To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. Where, where are our knowledgeable people? To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. There it is. So it's not just that the elders do it, but, but the gifts, the Holy Spirit yeah. distributes gifts as he chooses. Yeah. And so there are some of you here that have the gift of healing. Now, now we don't use it to get book deals, to get followers on Instagram. That's not what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. It's for the common good of the church and to put God on display to the world. Now, on a, does that mean that every time we pray, someone will be physically healed? No. That's not what I'm saying. You know why I'm not saying that? Because I'm not God. God does whatever he wants. Because he's God. So I know many of us have, we have tons of prayer requests crying out to God, God, would you do this? Would you please, would you, meet me? would you provide here? Would you open this door? And I wanna come around you and pray in expectation that God will do it. But at the same time, I also wanna be able to sit in the tension that goes, you know what? And if he doesn't, he is still glorified and he probably didn't do it because that's not what you needed. But permit me to tell you a prayer that God will answer every single time. And I am sure of it. I am sure of it. There is a prayer that God will answer. I, I, will, I pray this prayer, like when, when, when you pray it, I just, I just know, I just know he'll answer it. 
and that is the prayer of salvation. Amen. To look to the heavens and to go, I need a savior. I cannot save myself. I need to be spiritually healed. He will answer it every single time. I know it. All because of the blood of Jesus. Benefit number six. We're given peace. Because of Jesus' blood, we can have perfect peace. Now, there will still be plenty of battles this side of heaven. But we can navigate through them because we've received peace. We walk in the shalom that the blood of Jesus gives us. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Like people should be looking to the church and going, we don't get it. Everyone is panicking and you guys aren't. We're covered in the blood, that's why. Colossians 1, verse 19 to 20 says this, "For for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The blood of Jesus gives us peace with the Father. It gives us peace with one another. And then it gives us internal peace. And there are people in here who are living in chaos and uncertainty. Like, your, your life is just a panic. And for like legitimate reasons, I think, for some. There are people in here who who are not experiencing peace with others because of church hurt. I've heard it said that there is no hurt like church hurt. But also there is no love like church love. And, And the... The, the peace of God is made available to you. That even though, even though people are doing and saying and acting a certain way, you can just go, you know what? I'm covered in the blood. Father, I need your peace. It transcends, it surpasses all understanding. And then the last one, I'm gonna call the band up and we'll close out here. I'm assuming that like, the sound still works. Okay, because I was happy to sing a cappella as well. The The seventh and final benefit that the blood of Jesus gives us is access to the throne. Jesus' blood has made it possible for our complete reconciliation with the Father now covered by the blood of Christ. We are like the high priest who enters into the most holy place. See, before that, only one. Only one could go on behalf of everyone. But because of the blood, we can all enter. You can enter the most holy throne room of heaven and fellowship with God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22 says this, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. And so, this morning, if if you need Forgiveness, if you need to be cleansed, if you need to be set apart, if you you need God's sanctifying work in your life, if you're in desperate need for his redemption and all the benefits that come from it, freedom, 
authority over sin, death, and Satan. Where there's just justification. I want to live in light of my justification. Whether it's healing, spiritual healing. Or maybe there's a a physical ailment that you have right now and, and you need healing from that. Whether it's peace. Peace with God. Peace from God. Peace in a particular relationship. Peace in your marriage. Peace with your kids. Peace with your colleagues. Peace with your neighbor. We can boldly approach the throne of grace and ask our Father for those things because we have been covered by His blood. We have access to the throne room. And so, Father, now as we stand and sing, my prayer is that these wouldn't just be words on a screen, but that that they would compel us to move towards you. The blood still works. It still works. Oh, Father, there is unforgiveness in this room. May the blood of Jesus allow folks to release people. There are, there are people and situations and circumstances that we're still holding on to because we have bitterness and, and anger. And so, Father, I pray, I pray that folks would release that. the sin that so easily entangles us, as the writer of Hebrews says. The things that we keep going back to, even though we say, God, not again, not again. This time it's gonna be different. This time it's gonna be different. First and foremost, God, I pray that you would release those people of that condemnation that they feel after committing that sin because for those who are in Christ, there is now no condemnation. And then, God, I pray that you would release them from the lies that tell them that that thing that they run to will satisfy them, that will give them, it'll give them life, it'll give them purpose. I release them from that by the blood of Jesus. Or how our country needs to be covered in the blood of Jesus. And then Lord, I pray that you would release the church, that we would be salt and light in the areas that we live, work and play that we would operate out of the blood of Jesus, that there are so many people who need to hear the name of Jesus, that the gospel is not just information, but it's invitation, that you are inviting people into a relationship with you. Oh, would you send us out with boldness and truth, with conviction? You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Help us, help us, Father. Help us to be all that you have called us to be. The blood still works. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name.